So this, I will save some time here because this is a very short and sweet um, presentation. And it is genuinely a poster. So this is a poster uh, that we prepared. Uh, and um, it arose from work that I did some years ago with Catherine Wagner on trying to make a model of FSHD. There wasn't a decent mouse model about, and I think there still isn't. So we tried grafting pieces of muscle from FSHD patients and from their yeah. unaffected relatives. So this is manual muscle regeneration in the elderly. It struck, so we got really quite good regenerates of some of the grafts that we did, including a couple that came by chance from the mortuary. Um, and so I thought it would be a good prospect, good chance to actually look at regeneration of human muscle in vivo. So up to now, virtually all of the work on regeneration of human muscle has been done in tissue culture. Uh, and um, the uh, prospect of actually consider comparing how muscles from different age, people of different ages um, was quite uh, enticing. Uh, and so um, in, in Washington, we decided to try to use um, post-mortem muscle because it's easier to get and avoids the problems, the ethical problems of taking muscle biopsies from people. <coughs> um, and, um, and to graft these into um, uh, immunodeficient mice with the idea that they will grow up in there and we could compare how well muscles from different aged donors would do. Um, so I will start off with one of the problems we ran into, which was that it was very hard, surprisingly, to get cooperation from mortuaries to um, obtain pieces of, pieces of um, autopsy material, sterility from different um, um, cadavers in, the, in their mortuaries. Um, with a, in Washington, I would have thought we would have had no shortage whatsoever of um, cadaver muscle, including from young people. And in fact, we got no, we got no really young muscles and this rather diminished the value of the, of the um, um, project. But anyway, we did get some data as, as I will sh show you here. So um, the idea was that we would take muscle from, piece, from cadavers, uh, of people who died at various ages and then graft them. One of the, of the um, fe features of this grafting system, which makes life a lot easier, is that we found that you could graft the muscles at various intervals after, after uh, uh, death. So we, we took the pieces of biopsy we got where they were sterile and we kept them in, in minimum essential medium at four degrees in the refrigerator until we had the mice available to graft them into because the, the, the mice also were a limiting factor here. <clears throat> so this is an example, if I blow it up a bit. Um, if I can move this, yes, I can move it. So these are muscles um, grafted from various ages of cadavers grafted into mice. And so we know what the human, this is the mouse muscle here, for instance, shown in the, shown in the, um, okay. Yes, so this is, one, this, is, this is one of the things that set us off on this course. So during the, during, in the process of looking at the muscles from FSHD patients, we looked at one lady who had died over the weekend uh, and so Tracy Zhang, who I marked, who I worked with, um, uh, took a sample from this uh, cadaver and grafted it, and it really grafted very well. This is this is a human muscle um, shown as being human with um, um, a, a lamin A, a human-specific lamin A antibody, and a human-specific spectrin antibody, um, and so you, you can see both the nuclei in green and the muscle fibers outlined in red. Uh, and if I can get onto my other, so this is the poster. Um, and um, so this is an example of some of the, of the, of the individual graphs we made showing up in the same way with, with lamin A, with lamin A uh, to show the human nuclei and with humans anti-human spectrin to show the um, muscle fibers uh, or the cells um, of human origin in toto. And so we grafted from a variety of ages and we didn't get any really young people, uh, but we got really quite people up into their, uh, up into their 70s and, eight, and near 80s. 
Um, and so all of these really grew quite well. And so we thought we would try to compare overall. Um, and, you know, I, I had one of the few things I learned from the coronavirus um, uh, epidemic is, or pandemic, is that I am elderly. Uh, and so I took a personal, more personal interest in the whole whole business. So as an elderly person, I'm really, I'm up in this age. And so I'm, I take great heart from the fact that this particular um, piece of muscle really um, grafted and grew quite well. So these, when you make these grafts, the fibers in the muscle die off and then are replaced by a very strong regeneration um, of, the, um, of the satellite cells, I guess, uh, but all of the cells involved in myogenesis from the human graft. And so you can see you get really quite good um, pieces of muscle here. This is just a high power. Uh, and you can see that most many of the nuclei uh, are, are in a peripheral position already. Uh, we think that these bigger fibers are areas that have been innovated uh, post grafting as well as having regenerated. Um, and um, so these are quite respectable size muscle fibers. They're in sort of the 50, 40 to 50 micron diameter range. Um, so again, this is just looking at, at the fact that you can keep these muscles post-mortem in the refrigerator for some days uh, without really losing their myogenicity. So this, this makes it convenient because it means you can get, in principle, quite a large number of grafts off of a single um, 100 milligram sample um, and graft them successively over days, and they will last up to 11, we've done up to 11 days post-mortem. The group in, in the, a group in the uh, Pasteur has also shown that muscle myonuclei, or that, that satellite cells uh, survive very well this period, this post-mortem period in, in a completely anoxic condition, um, which you know, comes, when I first started uh, working on muscle, we used to try to graft pieces of human muscle and we bent over backwards to see, to try to keep them oxygenated. Um, and it turns out that satellite cells really like anoxic conditions. They are very happy in them uh, and survive very well, uh, as you can see here for several days <coughs> and will regenerate perfectly well when placed in a suitable environment. Um, so this is the examples of all of the ages. This is the number of fibers we expect and fibers we got from different individual samples. And you can see that the very best one here is the oldest. Um, so there is no real problem with age. Um, I'm told that I'm losing my muscles because I'm damaging them on a daily basis by doing eccentric exercise or whatever. Um, and that my satellite cells are not competent to, to re replace them. And I think this argues strongly against that. It tells you that people in, in my age group are perf have perfectly um, good functioning myogenic capacities and can replace their muscles very well. So I think it argues strongly against the notion that, that, there, that the uh, status of your satellite cell population is uh, a major factor in your, in your age-related loss of muscle mass. Um, you can see that the, in, the, um, in the ones that we kept for six weeks in particular, there were lots of quite big muscle fibers. Uh, and, it turned, and you can see that also here. So this is the ferro diameters of people from various ages. You can see that the very old groups, the, the over 70s, which we kept did more six week um, samples from, they allowed, we allowed them for, to regenerate for six weeks, um, have a big blob here of, um, of fibers that grew bigger than the rest. Um, and we think it's because we left them in for six weeks and they became innovated and grew into larger fibers. So you can see a few examples of these down here, for instance. This is actually three weeks post grafting, but you can see that many of these fibers look very like very good normal pieces of muscle. And the muscle, um, the chunks of regenerated muscle as a whole are frequently very good. They, they've got not too much in interstitial fibrosis uh, and they contain very large numbers of fibers. We also found that there was some participation. So you can see that there are some, there are some nuclei in some of these fibers, uh, which are unmarked by the, which are blue. I don't know whether you can see how blue they are. They're marked with arrows. There's one there, um, which are blue and they haven't, they are not human. They don't have the human lamin mark on them. 
So we think that this is um, um, some mouse mitochondria participating. So I'll take this down in size. This is one. So uh, the upshot of this really is that people of my age, and probably most of your ages, uh, have perfectly good um, regenerative capacities in their muscles. When people have studied them in tissue culture, they have found that they, that they don't work so well as younger ones. But we found a, we've done a whole lot of comparisons between what happens to regeneration in the mouse, for instance, in tissue culture versus in vivo, and they are often quite different answers. So old, old mouse uh, satellite cells will, will regenerate very well um, in, if grafted, but, not, but they won't proliferate very well in tissue culture. So I think tissue culture frequently gives us the wrong impression of um, uh, how, um, uh, how good our cells are, how effective our myogenic cells are. Um, we should look more in, tissue, more in vivo. The other thing that's worth remarking on here is that these fibers have, grow, have regenerated and grown up into quite big fibers in the context of an alien uh, cytokine system. So all of the inflammatory cells and all of the muscle cytokines that float around are of mouse origin. But these muscle fibers, these muscle cells, have regenerated well and made large fibers in that context. And I think that's worth bearing in mind when you are looking at cytokine specificities. Thank you, Professor, for this very nice uh, and original talk. Um, we have 10 minutes, Ugo. How much time do yes, we have yes. for questions? Uh, I have one simple question. May I go to the butcher? Butcher? Macellaio. Butcher? Bachelor, no. And buy yes, yes, a, a yeah, beef no. steak. And instead to cook, I will collect satellite cells to do xeno tra transfer. Yeah. Transplant. No longer. Even when yeah. the, the, the meat is ready to be eaten 20 yes. days after killing the animal? We only went to 10 and we didn't eat any of them. But you did some of these experiments with the animal... So these are human, to, these are human muscles. Mouse. Yeah. Yes. How, long, how long survive the satellite cells in a... We uh, did up to anoxia, In a full anoxia, I suppose. Yes. yes. We did up to 11 days. So the first of those, so the first few days they spent in a refrigerator in an anoxic condition. But the last, you know, it takes a few days for the blood vessels to grow into these grafts. So they spend a few days at 37 degrees in an anoxic condition. And I think this may be quite important for a generation of muscle in very large contusions where the centers will be anoxic. I fully agree. When you have necrosis of a big muscle, yeah. the satellite cell stay there. Well, that's what they say. That's what they say. You yes, don't see them. Agree. You, you, uh, you, thank you. Uh, they, it they is are. the first time that I listen something more crazy than my own results. <laughs> but, but true. Yes. <laughs> so I hope also mine are true. OK, Possibly. so there is thank a question from uh, Professor Protasi. Yeah and also from Professor Naichi. Feliciano? Yes, um, beautiful news you are giving us. I'm sure you are aware of the work done by Thomas Randall uh, yes. a few years ago about the, the idea is that uh, when you look at satellite cells uh, in old animals, they don't work as well, but when you, uh, when you make a common circulation between uh, the old mouse and the young mouse, then the capabilities of the satellite cells of the old mouse are brought back. So there was this idea of the environment in which the cells live. You know? yeah. and, uh, how would you put your data in comparison to those? Well, I think these are young mice. I mean, we, you, these mice are very severely immunodeficient, so they, you can't get them to be very old. Um, so no, these, but are young, these are young mice. But on the other hand, all of the all of the cytokines and transcription factors and all of the inflammatory cells that are supposed to be involved heavily in regeneration are of mouse origin. 
So there but is you said problem. something at the beginning about satellite cells being uh, still very active after the after death, no? Uh, well, no, I'm saying that they 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 survive after death is what I'm suggesting. Um, but you, you are, still you still saw some great uh, uh, capability of the cells to duplicate or not? Yes. Well, uh, in culture, no, I don't think. I mean, we didn't do it in culture. Because that's what I'm saying. In culture, yes. probably yes. you are reproducing yes. a condition, yes. of a young blood, for example. Is that? Well, I don't think you are. I think you're de in culture, you're depriving these cells of all of the signals they'd be getting from the surroundings, including the vascular, including the vascular shell. Um, yeah. So I, th I, th I think you should be very careful about how you interpret tissue culture experiments uh, yeah. overall. Uh, and um, uh, so the, the, the French group, the group in the, from the past, uh, Tierney et al, for instance, no, no not Tierney in that case, um, um, have shown that also that at the same time as we were doing this, they showed that you got survival of satellite cells within, within pieces of, mus of muscle biopsy of human and mouse. Um, and um, uh, that they, per they proliferated perfectly well if you looked after them properly. And if you, I think they grafted them as well. Um, with these grafts, we get very good re reconstruction of muscle because I think the basement membranes survive in the piece of muscle that we, that we graft. Terry, there are a lot of questions. Could you yeah. give short answers? Yeah. Next, please. Okay, Thank Professor Marici. Okay. Hello. Actually, my question was the same as Feliciano asked. I just was, was wondering about the medium in, in yeah. which these uh, cells were exposed to, but... We just kept them in medium and essential medium. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there is another, another question from uh, Dr. Tajbash. Tajbash. Yes, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, speaking. sorry, sorry, sorry for my because pronunciation. It's okay, no problem at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to compliment, because there's a lot of uh, questions around this point. So the, the, the group that uh, um, uh, Terry was mentioning was uh, Fabrice Quetin and myself who published that paper in 2012. And what we should, the key points from that paper is that um, we can take biopsies from post-mortem individuals 30 days after they've been in the fridge from post-mortem individuals. And even after 30 days, you can get uh, myotubes forming from those satellite cells. Then um, what Fabrice did is took uh, biopsies from individuals ranging from 55, 57 to 95 years old, 17 days post-mortem. And in 100% of the cases, we got myogenesis. And then we did transplantation of those uh, cells. So the two key, points, two key points I'd like to insist on is one, that these cells, as Terry was mentioning, are in 0% oxygen, essentially. And if you put them in culture, they die. So you have to put them in anaerobic bags to keep them alive and bring the oxygen up slowly. Two is the temperature. When we did this experiments with mice post-mortem, if you kept them at room temperature, you don't get the satellite cells back. If you keep them in the fridge or below eight degrees, you get the satellite cells back. So two important yeah. conditions. Yeah. And you can push, we went to 17 days post-mortem, but we think we can go even further. Yeah. In my, my first professor was, was Sir Peter Medawar, who wrote a, a book called The Uniqueness of the Individuals, in which he pointed out that if you are worried that you may be buried alive, you almost certainly will. <laughs>